Um, it's really nice to have you uh, at our selection for um, the experimental competition at Kurtaj Villa do Kande. Um, your film is um, wonderful. <laughs> And um, aggregate states of matter. Um, your film uh, happens was shot in the Andes, right? Um, and, and it deals with this uh, thematic of climate change in remote areas. Uh, but you chose specifically um, the Andes uh, and this glacier to film. So we'll, I would start uh, by asking you maybe to explain our viewers. Um, why this region in particularly uh, the, the, the problematic that the film um, tries to approach connected to this area of the Andes. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Um, yeah, so with, um, with this film, Aggregate State of Matters, um, I, was, I was interested in going into an area where there is like very extreme climate conditions like um, a huge uh, desert and then glaciers in, in the same in the same country and also um, the the highest um, population of an indigenous community that still exists uh, which I think is for me they are some they are some sort of knowledge keepers because they they live so close to nature and they relate and um, and, uh, and yeah and live within the nature so their whole life is constructed or um, uh, like to 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 live with it and um, to transform with it so I was um, interested to learn from these communities uh, for this film but in a in a way how you can maybe learn like you can maybe produce some artistic knowledge through filmmaking and not um, may, like a, a journalistic approach. So um, that was uh, the, the basic ideas of making the film. Yeah. Um, it, is, it is interesting that you, you immediately start uh, by mentioning this, um, uh, this community, you know, this population, the Keshwan, I think I'm saying mm -hmm. it right, yeah. um, because the, the film really uh, approaches as well from what I could see this relation between humans and nature, specific, specifically through these um, communities that in one hand they are so close to nature in their daily day life, but at the same time they are so highly affected by um, the effects of, of, of climate change. Um, and so maybe you could talk us a bit more about the, the concrete situation that you found there uh, with, this, with this particular community. Yeah, um, I mean, I was um, then traveling with one Quechuan community for a while and we, um, so I, I was invited to to be part of their uh, main offering um, that they um, that takes place once a year where they make an offering to, to the glacier. And um, so that was a kind of like, the, yeah, a main happening in the film. But then beside that, I also visited another um, community at the Titicaca Lake. Um, so basically the film, uh, filming happened throughout the whole countries, starting from the north uh, glaciers near Huaraz and then uh, down in, until the Titicaca Lake. And so I, I encountered many different um, people and communities and I made these interviews also throughout um, the film. Um, yeah, but before I even went for the first time, I went uh, several times, but the first, before I even went the first time, of course, I was um, trying to research uh, from, from here. And um, I was very amazed also by uh, that, actually the, 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 the melting of the glaciers can also produce some positive effects for the farmers because of course then they have suddenly more water and but it's only this kind of temporary um, wealth uh, of, uh, for agriculture and then it will soon like, dry out and, and um, yeah and, and disappear. So it's also the cycles of how actually something that is very dramatic can first, turn into even some kind of blossoming and then 
and then it can you know it's this continuous cycle that i was also interested in which which might be um related to uh, the idea of temporality as well that is so present in your work i would like to go back mm -hmm. to that at some point mm -hmm. uh, but um i would still ask you a bit more about this um your work with the communities um uh in order to approach this idea that you you explore uh different local myths and the myths i i believe uh, that in this work they are carried by the language the role of language in your film your interviews and so on um, and maybe um, you could t talk to us a bit more about uh, the role of myth in your work and particularly in this this film that you present now the role of myth i i am i was also int interesting how how yeah how this mythology also transforms within um the transformation of the landscape, for example, this offering uh, adapted was adapted by the community because before they would take a, a big piece from the from the glacier um, and bring it down to to the village and have the celebration there. And now, um, with with the with the, the kind of precarious situation, they don't want to to touch the the glacier anymore. So the whole offering also changed which i mean just also even thinking from other um um kind of traditional like it's very hard sometimes to imagine other things to adapt and so um and i found it so natural also how even something so holy like this kind of offering was able to transform because the nature is transforming also, I was also asking you about the the carrying of this this myth through through language that oh, yeah, yeah. is in your film, uh, but now you just mentioned this and um, it occurred to me how um, how how interesting it might be uh, to to observe and, and your film deals a lot with landscape mm -hmm. uh, and so to observe how how um, landscape is changing and the myth is 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 changing with it through this, mm -hmm. this climate change. Yeah, um, as well. Yeah. But that was also visually uh, a decision how to deal with all these layers and all these transformations that um, I didn't want a kind of author authoritarian voice or like a voiceover that is going to explain or so it was also this decision to to have the language embedded in the visual appearance and also as something that you can grasp and can go and that you know it's also this idea that you can see the film several times and then you you hear or you read a different voice and and see a different um um yeah um image with within yeah i would go back again to uh, as you mentioned the circularity um mm -hmm. the idea of time you do speak often about this um idea of deep time uh describing your your work the title of the film is aggregate states of matter it does transport me us to to the notion of time maybe this geological time mm -hmm. um and i would like to ask you um how does the title of the film uh relates with your with your own um interpretations of of the notion of time and temporality um, in your work and in this work particularly, of course. Yeah, I mean, as you said, um, it is very much um, driven by this kind of archaeological time. And actually also, as also, um, I relate very much uh, uh, with the, the how indigenous people relate to time, which is a very much uh, a non, not a chronological one. It's really something that is layered on, on top of each other. and. Um, and this is also why I made some visual decisions like that. I, for me, it is always um, trying to go into the different layers and and how to reveal certain information, and 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 like more like a, a play uh, in this kind of uh, vertical directions, uh, rather. Mm -hmm. um, with layers. Um... 
this takes us to also um, the media that you work with. The, in this case, is the, it's, it's in 35 millimeters. Uh, and we do know that all media um, arts, they, they, they do tend to speak about um, them, themselves or itself um, and their own contemporary conditions, of course. So um, I would like to, to ask you about the, your, your choice um, your, your choice of working with the analog probably might be connected to this temporality, of course, but how do you place it as well in, um, in its contemporary meaning? Mm -hmm. Yeah, I mean, for this film, I actually shot in different medias. I, um, I was, when I went up to the 5,500 uh, meter mountains to, to go to the glacier, I was shooting with a 16 millimeter camera, lots of these kind of trips. And then the aerial footage, I had a 35 millimeter camera. And so um, that's why in the film, you see also these different, um, this, this different framings, because I also wanted to leave them all in their original format. Uh, but then of course they all, they all come together in this kind of 35 millimeter space. And um, yeah, for, for me, uh, it is also important to, to this decision to have left these different um, formats, because I'm also interested in this kind of multiplicity of of images and of formats and um, and of course the, the the 35 millimeter is is always a, a decision um, or, or in film in general because it is another way of inscribing inscribing time and it and and um, and I'm interested in this kind of inscriptions in, in landscape and and how we, as we know now, that that film is also a very important archi archival um, holder. How that, I mean, a lot of important things will trans will be transferred back or is transferred back to film because it will last longer than than a digital medium. And um, and the same time, I'm I'm often wondering what how these inscriptions in landscape can. Um, tell us something in the future um, you know with my former films like the bending to earth where i was filming the nuclear wastelands how it's an something that will last longer to disappear than the earth ever existed and this kind of um, uh, timelines of time um, is very very interesting to me and uh, film gives me this possibility to to think about all that better and to, to work with a material that really inscribes layers by layers through light into the, into the, um, yeah, into the material and the material that can actually become an archival material as well. That, that makes me want to ask you something, um, I, I would say to, to, to finish your, our interview, mm -hmm. that is not um, so directly connected to this film of yours itself, um, that you are presenting at Kurtas, once again, Aggregate States of Matter, uh, but this um, project that I just saw that you have started building in uh, Cyprus, mm -hmm. maybe you could introduce it because I, I do believe that from the very little that I've, I've read about it, um, that it might have to do with this uh, idea of staging, stagings and your um, and landscape, as you have been um, describing now, you are placing a, a huge screen on a sort of, an, what it looks like, an amphitheatre um, in, in landscape. And maybe you, you could um, tell us just a little yeah. bit about it. Yeah, I, I'm, I'm honestly very curious. <laughs> yeah, no, it's actually super exciting. I just came back from Cyprus where I was uh, following the construction of the cinema and I was also shooting there. Um, yeah, I mean, it took, it was like seven years ago when I was invited to propose or say, or like make a project in Cyprus and then I traveled and, and of course the buffer zone that was implemented in since the war in 1974 was very very like was this strange place that is like yeah completely 
cut and 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 this space in between that is like yeah surveyed by the UN but and there is no construction and there is actually no place where an, a cultural exchange can happen and so on so I propose this kind of insane thing to say why could I build a cinema there and um, and then somehow now seven years later it's happening and um, it it like it was somehow also I think a kind of sneaky because in a way it, it needed maybe somebody from the outside. I, I actually applied for it for an Italian grant and I got the Italian grant and through this Italian grant, the Italian embassy in Cyprus was interested to speak to the UN and then suddenly there was a permission. And, um, and so the idea of this, it's this circle that is also uh, reminding us of these antique forms and amphitheaters that were part of this island um, before all these conflicts. And the screen is, well, you know, a screen that I usually work with, with a perma permeable screen, so you can see the film on both sides. And it is kind of invitation that all communities could come and share the space together. So at the moment, it will be finalized now, so that the carving of the amphitheater is still not ready, but um, it will be ready in a few weeks. And, um, and the idea is that then I will start uh, to, to propose a sort of board of people who work with film and filmmakers. Of course, it has a lot like in with uh, um, artists or filmmakers from North and South Cyprus that are part of this whole idea and that we start to, to program it. And, um, and you are and interfering directly with, with landscape itself. And the yeah. politics of it. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, that's. But of course, it should also be just. Uh, also, hopefully, schools will use it, and and uh, kids. It should really be something that both sides can come together without showing a passport and um, can watch movies, even if they would watch their home movies or something on it. Yeah. So I hope it will be then accepted as such a space. Yeah. I, I would have never imagined it to be then so strong just as, as an image. It already just kind of opens doors, <laughs> and which was, was really beautiful to see. Well, I, I did saw one image that you shared about it, and I was mm -hmm. um, incredibly happy to see it. <laughs> so, no, yes. I'm, I'm very curious. Um, mm. Well, I would like to thank you very much for this um, for this uh, warming interview uh, that you gave to Kurtas Vila do Conde um, and, and um, hoping to see you more. Yeah, I hope, too. I hope that I can come next year or something. <laughs>